Good. Just go ahead and uh, set up the camera so it's a little closer. Want to set up front first? Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. Actually, what I want to do is we're just going to set up right back. Uh, just set up a round table instead of using all this. Oh. Okay. Here comes one of our other. This is this is the guy you're going to have to really deal with here. <laughs> How you doing? I'm Jeff George. <laughs> nice to meet you, Bruce. Hi, Josh. How you doing? <laughs>
Pittsburgh? I mean, in, in Ohio? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I lived in Detroit. There was a war in Michigan. I too. think there's a war everywhere, yeah. up in the northeast somewhere. It's one there's of probably even a war in peace. <laughs> I don't know. If that's something that's actually. Nice. Chris is involved in telecom. <laughs> you were involved in telecom. I worked uh, actually. I worked for a company that was based out of uh, out of Naples. Here it was called Air Data Alignment Systems. Uh, it was a wireless last uh, last mile system uh, that we were trying to get out there in the uh, in the late nineties, okay. uh, early part of the decade. But uh, the company was, uh, it was actually a fairly well-established company in Germany. Uh, they had a lot of uh, military contracts, uh, and they had actually developed uh, what they called the, the magic brick. Uh, it was this solid piece of aircraft aluminum uh, radio, uh, radio, and it was basically ISDN equivalent. All right. And uh, they developed it actually when the Germans de deployed to Somalia, uh, because they, uh, what they found was that they had to have a wireless system because they would lay copper wire down and the Somalis would steal all the copper wire. That makes so, sense. Makes sense. Sure. What they ended up doing was digging a trench and, and filling in the trench with concrete, putting the wire in and filling it in with concrete. Right. But so they developed that system and they decided to sell it commercially. But uh, we set up networks all over the US, uh, South America, Colombia, Argentina, uh, Haiti, uh, Canada. Where else did we go? went to Nigeria a couple times, right. uh, all over Europe. Really? Cool. So yeah, it was a great experience. What was the name of the company? Air Data Wyman Systems. Wyman? W-I-M-A-N. Wireless Metropolitan Area Network was what it stood for. Because we used the wireless, when I used the wireless ISDM when we first moved here in 99. That was probably us. Probably was you. Yeah, that was probably us. Because we, for some reason, we couldn't get a good thing in the building, and the rate was outrageous. Yeah, we had a lot of problems with the with the, the, the ISDN. Yeah, the ISDN. Okay. Just well, it was actually it was ISDN equivalent. <coughs> was like a true ISDN okay. line. All right. Uh, it was a uh, it was a hundred uh, almost not quite hundred twenty megabits or kilobits. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, time times change. Can't even think of kilobits anymore. Right. But exactly. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, was a, it was a really good system. Uh, the problem was is we, we were getting ready to roll out the second generation, which I think was uh, ended up being four megabits. But yeah. in, that, in the meantime, of course, fiber and, and well, everything. They sold that to someone, they sold Sheraton to someone. Yeah. They owned everything in front of time. In fact, once. Yeah, it was a couple, it was during the 60s, they were like the. They were go go. They, they were the 11th largest company in the States. And I was an executive, so they would send the executive or ship mm -hmm. Every week they'd send a, sh a sheet of all the companies they acquired and all the companies they disposed of. And you, I don't know if you remember, they had a problem in Chile once. And one week this, this thing came out, companies acquired, it was like Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> it was the name of a country, <laughs> yeah, a sub Latin American country. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah, but I know it was, it was, that was an interesting time to, in the late 90s, I mean, obviously to be in the, the, the telecom business because, you know, the problem that we had as a small com company, and I think it really changed with the Telecom Act in 97, was when they lifted up the ownership requirements. I mean, basically there was a lot of good technical innovations that came out of that, but uh, I think the, the, the big problem with that was when they lifted ownership requirements because what happened is it became increasingly difficult for small companies to compete in the uh, in the market, because what do you mean they lifted ownership requirements? The ownership, uh, the, the FCC lifted requirements for uh, basically uh, um, took them off or raised them. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they raised, raised them. them. Yeah, uh, uh, the number of uh, stations, radio stations, TV stations, uh, media outlets, basically the companies could own. And that was kind of the gimme that was added to that bill. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what that ended up doing is what we saw is. We were starting to see in the late 90s, small companies had a really hard time competing in the high tech field because if you came up with a good product, uh, a big company would basically either reverse engineer your, your system or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or uh, throw a bunch of money. Hi, how are you? I'm Jack Edwards. Yeah, Dan, yeah, right. Nice to meet you, Dan. Hi, Sonny. Hey, Dan. Good to see you. Good hey, buddy. How's it going? See you, man. Oh, no problem. Sorry, man. But I had a I had a friend who developed a really good uh, basically it's a, uh, an integrated PC and TV system uh, that they developed about five six years ago and, and they were trying to get it out to market and they went to every big company and uh, basically uh, about a 
year or two ago, I forget who it was, released, it released almost the exact same system. Yeah. They just reverse engineered. That it does. We, um, we developed software for airline ticket for a lot because we were, there was a lot of reason, but we had the technology, we invited them all out to see it. They loved it. We were actually the first one. Hi, how you doing? I'm Jeff Hi. George. Nice to, you nice to meet you, Sean. Nice to meet you, Sean. Hi. Hey, I want to meet you guys. I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Nice to meet you, Dan. Nice Sean. I'm Bruce. Nice to meet you, Hi, I'm Gus. Hi, Gus. Hi, I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi. We're all part of the group. Yeah, we're all part of the meeting. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I'm going to give a friend of mine a real quick. Call. They weren't giving out uh, about the use patents back when you uh, did what you did. In the business, that was pretty much late nineties when they started. The Microsoft started kind of pushing that topic. Yeah, we were so far ahead of ourselves. Yeah, it was, ahead, yeah. yeah, it was just we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, uh, we got our own world there. Yeah, it's just. Uh, yeah, you know, it's just. Uh, this was just for our group. No, no, no. No, it's for everybody. But we're the only ones that seem to want to listen to them. <laughs> we're the only three of ours. But how was it publicized? I didn't see it anywhere. Okay, Gus did all the publicity. I met him personally, and he gave me this flyer. Uh, okay, we got a pretty small He's having a meeting here at the library. So we so had to meet up and get him. Why is it like, may have the most time? Okay. We did do it. Yeah. I wasn't sure how many people were coming, so. No, no, just how would that work? Okay, so just. How you doing, Dan? Sean Bess. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's probably easier for you to. It's a little easier to everybody. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm just going to get over here. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So, how do you feel about the fact that you're here? And this is for all of Naples and. Collier and Charlotte. Right now, and <laughs> we did, well, this is okay because we didn't really we didn't publicize this event too much. All we did is we had uh, put this in the paper. I think just this week we had we had planned to do a whole bunch of library meetups and then the, the idea kind of fell by the wayside, so we didn't do any promotion. So basically, this was just talking to Gus, and Gus said he was going to get a couple people to come over. So because I was actually we were about to get ready to cancel the room for the weekend uh, mm -hmm. before I talked to Gus last week. So. I don't think this, uh, this isn't bad at all. We want to make a challenge for you and put you in front of the only woman in the group so that you can. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. oh, yeah. so my wife will be there going, okay, now. She'll come here in a minute. She's her, she has a good one of her you know, post office. So you're running for Connie Max position? Yes, that's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And have you ever? This is the first, uh, this is the first time I've actually run for office. Thought about doing this back in 2002, uh, but uh, the way that I wanted to conduct this campaign, and, uh, technically, uh, and also the political environment that was quite right back then. Um, you know what we're doing. You see, uh, Damian back here with the camera. Um, everything that we do uh, on the campaign, uh, we, we videotape, uh, and if we can't get a live link uh, going immediately, then we take all of the raw footage and we put it on the web. Uh, and this is part of our overall commitment to principles of transparency, integrity, and accountability. Because uh, essentially, and I mean, we can see this on the presidential campaign trail this year. Every four years, every two years, you have all of the uh, uh, new politicians that pop up and say, hey, I'm a candidate for change. I'm the one that's going to change everything. And then, of course, they go to office and they don't actually change anything. So what we decided to do is it's not enough to say that you want to change things. It's not enough to go up there and say, hey, trust me, I'm a politician. I'm never going to do anything wrong. We wanted to see if we could use the new media in a way that's really never been done before to actually create a mechanism that, number one, the constituency can actually talk to their representative on a more regular basis. And number two, is equally important that we have full transparency. That uh, you know I'm not going to come here and I'm not going to talk to the uh, to the people who got the Ron Paul group uh, started up and say one thing and then go over to people who got the Kucinich group started up and say a completely different thing. Um, and we'll see how this works out. Um, you know, of course, the, the thing is when you have the camera constantly rolling, 
everything that you say is there and is recorded, and it requires a certain level of maturity that I'm not sure is, is there. I know the American people have that level of maturity, but when we talk about the media and we talk about campaign coordinators and that sort of thing, I'm not sure if they'll take something that I said in passing, hour three of a meeting somewhere. And, and they will. Oh, of course they will. It's it's another time, but. It happens in all of life. So well, that's probably going to happen. Unreported life. Yeah. <laughs> but it's more real in reality than standing up in front of a bunch of people and talking about how you're going to be Superman. Exactly. And we already know, each one of us knows, Superman's a fairy tale. That that's really a fairy tale. You know, I mean, we have a lot of questions for you. I don't know how you feel about that's you what just I'm want here us for. to. That's, uh, that's why we don't have the, uh, the, the, the podium up there, so I'm not standing back there. Because, you know, uh, and again, uh, you know, every candidate goes out there and they say, oh, I'm an accessible candidate, you know, and more often than not, accessibility depends greatly on how much you actually bring uh, in your, I your you, checkbook. I first noticed you forgot your lapel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually forget it. It's in a bag no, over there, so. No, I've never I worn it. I, I went and I got a, a name tag. No, I was kidding. No, I, actually, I got a name tag and I had never thought about wearing it and they had it like in a basket. At the print shop, they had them there for like a buck a piece. So I said, you know what? I'm going to buy one of these. <laughs> see if I can go the entire campaign without you might actually wearing one. Yeah. I just, yeah, I can't. Sometimes I watch the news and it's just painful. But uh, yeah. yeah the, well, the you know. The pen thing was definitely. I mean, can you imagine in, in our world today with all the problems that that would be the issue? Exactly. People dying, children dying, and, you know, all over the world. And, and, and let's talk about the flag pen. And that's what you have to walk out, watch out for. That uh, I was reading uh, the, uh, the speech that uh, Ron Paul gave about patriotism, and I mean, I think that that hits the, the nail right on the head there. Uh, you know, you got to patriotism isn't about uh, what you wear. It's not about what you of you course. stick on your car. It's about what you actually do. You know, and uh, and the idea that somehow if we have any sort of disagreement or that we, God forbid, should actually have a real discourse. About uh, about politics or about uh, uh, world events, that one side has to be unpatriotic and the other side is patriotic. That's nonsense. And uh, I, again, I hope one of the things that we can do with this campaign, uh, the way that we're conducting it, is get around some of that. Now, of course, the risk that we run is, uh, you know, that I've been out here actually since last November, having meetings like this and going around and videotaping everything, and there's probably a couple hundred hours now of video footage up on the web of, of everything that I've done. And I can't imagine anyone would want to sit through and watch it all. But the important thing is we have that there. So uh, if it comes down to uh, September, October, November, you know, where the attack ads come out and they take something out of the context, we've got the context. And hopefully we'll have the resources so we can get up there and refute it right away. But if not, we'll have the last word. And uh, I mean, this is the way that I look at it. There is no way possible for me to lose this campaign. Uh, because if I don't win the actual election, we've done something that no one ever, no one else has ever done before, and uh, I can fall back to my experience as a documentarian, and we can make sure that we show the people in Southwest Florida, the people all over the country, you know what we really want. So um, either way, uh, what happens in November is the first salvo of this. Either uh, we take the show to Washington, we take the cameras and everything to Washington, and continue there, or uh, we keep building the momentum to have a more, uh, transparent and more accountable form of uh, politics. So let me uh, just, uh, I, I know it looks like most of you got the, uh, got the brochures and everything. So instead of me yammering on, let's, uh, let me ask, answer some of your questions. Well, I can go right to the cut to the chase here. They're obviously you're going to be challenged uh, on a lot of different levels. And so the um, question would be, uh, as an example, have you served in any other office prior to this? No, I haven't. And that's the beauty of the Constitution, is that we don't have a political class. You know, the requirements are that you're 25 and that you're a citizen. Uh, and that's what keeps us from having these uh, hereditary leaders like, uh, I don't know, like say George W. Bush or Kennedy. Connie Mack the fourth. <laughs> yeah, he's another good example. That's not an issue for me, but that will certainly be asked. Uh, um, the one kind of the elephant in the room, and I'm just being honest with you here, is that uh, I understand uh, you're Islamic. I'm a Muslim. Yes, that's correct. Now, that doesn't bother me, and I believe in freedom of religion, but I think in Southwest Florida that'll be a challenge, in, just in my opinion. How do, you, how do you think you deal with that? Well, there's a couple of different tacks to this. First of all, let me talk about how this plays out in the election. 
Uh, and then I want to talk about how it affects my personal views because I think that's uh, just as important, if not more important. First of all, how it plays out in the election. You know, I think uh, that we're going out there and we're campaigning on the issues. And I think uh, the people, the majority of people that are going to have a, re a knee jerk reaction and say, okay, this guy's a Muslim, I'm never going to vote for him, aren't going to agree with me on the issues, anyways. So I'm not too concerned about losing that reactionary minority. Now, of course, we do have a lot of people uh, who aren't at all extremists, who aren't reactionaries, who have some reservations about it. And the first thing I have to say is that, you know, we go out there and we talk about the importance of spreading democracy uh, and spreading um, freedom around the world. What kind of message are we sending, number one? And number two, what does that say about us if the fact that somebody who's in a minority religion uh, is immediately not viable as a candidate? I, I don't think, uh, I think that that is counter to everything, number one, that America is about. And number two, I think it's also counter to the message that some of the people who are causing the problems right now are trying to put out. Um, now, how that affects my actual, my, my actual views, let me tell you how I became a Muslim, first of all. Uh, my family was Catholic, uh, and uh, my mother was never actually a practicing Catholic. I was baptized as a Catholic, never went to communion, I think I went to one or two weddings, that was it. I was always given a lot of freedom. Uh, when I was in the Army, I was in the Army for five years, uh, from 87 to 92. Uh, towards the end of that time, I started asking a lot of questions, and I started researching everything that I could about religion. And uh, increasingly, I came to look at, uh, uh, there's a branch of Islam called Sufism, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Or basically, it's sort of the, uh, for lack of a better term, it's sort of the mystical branch of Islam. It's sort of uh, the branch of Islam that's always, um, instead of emphasizing doctrine, it's always emphasized personal experience. Uh, and I, I, I started to read more and more about that, and in the course of that, also about Islam. Now, jump forward about 10 years to 2001, uh, after September 11th, uh, I suddenly found myself in a position where I was one of the few people who knew a lot about Islam in my immediate circle. So everyone, both Muslims and non-Muslims, would like, they'd ask me, I'd say something about the, about the faith, and they'd say, well, are you a Muslim? And uh, after a while, I had to think about it, and I said, and I realized that you know, if I look at how I feel about God and, and where I think I can be the most effective in this lifetime, uh, then the answer is yes, I am a Muslim. So I took Shahada in 2003, which is the proclamation of faith, uh, and I've been practicing Muslim ever since. Now. Having that faith, I know a lot of times what you have to watch out for, and I, I'm willing to bet um, that uh, uh, I, I don't want to get anybody's personal life, but is there anybody here who, who feels deeply religious about uh, about their faith? I do. Okay, great. So we got one. We got two. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, a, a, a society with a secular government, uh, you know, a lot of times when People look at somebody who's religious, particularly somebody who converted to a religion. They have this, um, they have this fear that you know this guy's a sudden convert. You know, he's basically we we've all seen you know the like for example addicts, or something like that. Who you know heroin is their entire life, and then suddenly uh, religion is their entire life, and they want to force that religion on everybody. Um, you know, they want to go out and talk about it. It was a very gradual process for me. It didn't happen that way, and I think. What I found in my, uh, my study of Islam was that the fundamental principles that this, this society is founded on, principles of justice, uh, the, uh, the, the, the principles of, of uh, believe it or not, democracy, uh, they have antecedents in Islam as a whole. Obviously, we see very different practices from areas, but they had those antecedents. And for me, growing up in America, I am absolutely 100 uh, percent committed to having a firm separation between church and state. Uh, and this is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you have to protect the nation. You know, one of the things, uh, as someone who's in a minority religion, I do get a little offended when people go up there and they say, this is a Christian nation. Uh, and the reason I get offended is not because uh, I want to sue anybody or, or, you know, get anything taken off the flag or off the money or anything like that, but the reason I get offended is because, as an American, uh, this is not a Christian nation. This may be a nation with a majority of Christians, but it is an American nation. And what this country was founded on was the principle that whatever guides us as individuals, when we come together in the public sector, that we put everything aside, that we put ethnicity, that we put
put religion, uh, that we put every creed aside and we recognize ourselves as Americans in the public sector. And so I don't want to see any sort of Sharia law pass in the United States or anything like that. Uh, and then the second thing is it's also a protection for the religion themselves. Because my personal feeling is that religion is best, uh, is best handled between the individual and God, between the individual and their higher power. And what happens when you start to mix religion and politics is not only does it pollute the, the stream of government, but it also pollutes the religious stream because suddenly you have these religious institutions, uh, like Kufi is a good example, Christians United for Israel, who just had a big conference this week. Uh, they're not engaged in what the individual spiritual needs are, their congregation are, so much as their, their political interests. Uh, and, and, that pollute, and that poisons the religion. I think so too, and I, and I wondered how you feel about churches as business. How do you feel? This is another, uh, another big issue. Um, I, I always think of, uh, there was an episode of The Simpsons uh, where uh, the, the church got, uh, the, the church, town church got destroyed and so Mr. Burns mm -hmm. refinanced the rebuilding of the church and like so many other mega churches, they had the, uh, uh, the TCBYs, yeah, yeah. The, the, the food, they had the, uh, the ATM uh, and as the, the, the Simpsons are walking along, uh, uh, there's a guy standing there, money changed, get your money changed here. <laughs> And Lisa's like, this is so blasphemous. <laughs> so, and, and, and that's what I think. I, I think, uh, you know, religion, it, it's about the soul. And, and this is where it needs to cover. Now, I think we need to have a more mature discussion about religion than what we often see in the media in this country. Because I think it's possible uh, for an individual to have a strong commitment to their faith uh, and be willing and be able to talk about it in the context of, of their personal motivation. I don't think we should jump on them for that. You know, I think uh, we see that. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm Jeff George. Yes, I'm Daniel Larson. How are you? Hi, you want, you want to come sit up here with, yeah, the, with us? Okay. This is a, more of a round table discussion than it is an audience thing, so. Yeah, that's okay. We're just sitting here listening. Okay, yeah, yeah, feel yeah. free to jump in at any time. Okay. Daniel's part of our group. Okay. Um, you, you know, when I you know, bring this up, it's not a challenge of your religion. It's actually, or your faith, it's really it's more a challenge oh, of I understand. the, uh, you know, how do perception you, of it. Well, and especially in South as far as very, yes. you know, it's just, we have a lot of fundamentals. There's, of, there's, there's no question about that. Christian dogma mm -hmm. that well, is politically influenced. That's what's wrong with our country. It's that my way is the only way. Well, that has certainly okay. been sold harder here in the sure. last eight years, and um, and after trying to divide by dividing we conquer is what has happened. So I, I think you sit on the advertised properly and spoken properly, I think it would be dealt with. And, and, and obviously, going outside of the, uh, the Republican Party with the, you know, the independents and Democrats who view that as a positive. And you know, that's the thing. I, I mean, the way that I look at it, and this isn't just coming from, from my personal faith, this is coming from uh, political sensibility. This is actually, this is an advantage to this campaign. Because number one, uh, it's something that's going to get this campaign more recognition. Uh, you know, people are going to say, hey, look, this is a Muslim. Yeah, you know, what's he thinking of running in South Rotary? <laughs> sure. I'm an independent, actually. Oh, okay, that's right, sorry. So, no party affiliation. Um, uh, I, and and uh, my, by the way, my name is Chuck Meyer, and I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the media coordinator for, for, for Jeff. And, and I just wanted to introduce myself without taking over the, the, the forum, like, like, say, other people might in, in other campaigns. But, um, uh, you know, uh, one, one of the things that's really interesting about this race in particular is you have you, you have a Muslim, a Jew, and birds hunters, and, and and two Christians, and I mean it sounds I mean it, first off it sounds like a, an old you know a, a Muslim, a Jew, and two Christians walking to a bar joke, but you know what what it, what, it, what it really is, and I think and, you know uh, you know hopefully uh, uh, what, what takes place is 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 you know people asking questions about okay you know. You're a Christian. What do you believe? You're a Jew. What do you believe? You're 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 a Muslim. What do you believe? And in the context of this race, I mean, rarely do you see you know the world three three most uh, popular religions, uh, uh, you know, people of those faiths going up against each other in an election, and rarely do you have that opportunity to have that kind of discussion. So I, I think that's one of many things about this race that, that that's and, and as a Muslim too, you know, uh, number one, I it gives me an inside track into the, the group that. Uh, I think the majority of Americans seem to feel is our right <coughs> uh, I, I understanding. And number two, again, it's it's about setting a good international example. 
you know, we never had a Muslim in Congress uh, before 2006. Uh, and then Keith Ellison was elected, uh, and, and then Andre Carson in Indiana won a special election earlier this year. Uh, so we now have two Muslims in Congress where two years ago we had none. Um, and uh, you know, if we're going to go out uh, and we're going to tell uh, people in Lebanon, people in the occupied territories, Egypt, everywhere that they need to have a democratic government, then we need to make sure that they understand that uh, in no shape or form is Islam incompatible with the fundamental principles of, the, of the principles of democracy. And, and again, I think you know um, uh, the the tradition, the, the way that Islamic society was traditionally structured. Uh, up until the late stages of the Ottoman Empire. Um, there was a real sort of uh, a checks and balance type of system. Uh, and in fact, uh, the people that lived uh, in the Islamic world up until the 18th, 19th century had more civil rights and had more rights than people in Europe. So uh, in, and obviously there's some reforms that have to happen there. But the important thing to take from that is not that Islam is a superior system, which I don't believe it, uh, in, in the context of government, I certainly don't believe it is, but that it is entirely compatible with what we consider to be Western uh, democracy or Western principles. And, and as, a, as a Muslim, this gives me the opportunity to go out there and discuss that, and not just a matter of saying, do as, I, do as we do, or do as we say, not as we do. I mean, you have Muslim actually doing it every day in the context of government. So I th again, I, again I, th I think it's an exciting plus for the campaign. It's not really a negative.